Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar on the topic of service for a strong future. The pandemic has wreaked havoc on the economy and amid rising unemployment and hiring freezes, Americans are seeking meaningful ways to help their communities. Today, we are joined by leaders in the field to learn about the importance of national service and volunteerism and to learn about the needs and opportunities within this critical sector during this pandemic and beyond. We're so pleased to um, have Laura Lauder, a JFM member, and, and from the Laura and Gary Lauder Philanthropic Fund to be here today, who is a great supporter of this sector, and she will moderate this conversation. I also want to mention that we would love for this to be you know, interactive. Um, when you have questions, please put it in the Q&A and in the chat. And later on, I'll be back um, when we have more time for Q&A. And if you wanted to, to, to be unmuted, raise, raise your hand in, the, in, in Zoom. I think most of you hopefully know how to do that at this point with being on so many different Zoom meetings the last bunch of months and we'll be able to hear from you directly and you can ask the panelists your questions. And with that, I want to again thank Laura for being with us today and moderating this conversation and pass it to you. Thank you. Thanks, Tamar. This is a sensational moment for this topic because never in our our, our country's history has it been more important for us to stand up for civics, for democracy, and to enable everyone to participate on an even playing field across the country, young and old, to volunteer and to participate in, in, in supporting and building our country. So I'm, I'm so thrilled to be joined by the best of the best of, uh, of, of civic leaders running very, very important and very high impact uh, national service or organizations. We're joined by Natalie Paquin, the CEO of the Points of Life Foundation, Jesse Colvin, CEO of the Service Year Alliance, and Cindy Greenberg, CEO of our Jewish communities, Repair the World. So let's kick it off right away and, and get started with, uh, with some really important uh, ways for all, each one of you to tell us, first of all, give us some, a, a sense of what your organization is, what it does, and perhaps a, 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 a an idea of why you personally have gotten involved in this work and what inspires you. So, Natalie, do you want to start us? Sure. Uh, thanks, Laura. And it really is a pleasure and an honor for, um, for Points of Light to join this very important uh, conversation. Uh, Points of Light is an organization, uh, we're a volunteer uh, organization, um, really combined of uh, a network of corporations, nonprofits, and individuals. Um, our mission is to inspire, equip, and mobilize people to take action uh, that changes the world and changes their community for the better. We are, um, our footprint is we're in over 200 cities and 37 countries each year through our partners. Uh, we help mobilize over 5 million um, people or individuals who are giving back and working on causes they care about. Uh, I would say I am uh, attracted to the organization and attracted to the mission because it really is about the power of people. Um, you know, we have this aspiration for people to um, get off the sidelines and um, and really remove barriers for others to get involved. And I, I know uh, through personal experience that when people get involved, the solutions really are in the community. It makes a big difference. Thanks so much, Jesse. Laura, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you to you and Tamara and to the JFN team. Uh, Repair the World and Points of Light are actually close partners of Service Year Alliances, so it makes great sense that we're here and I'm, we're honored to be here. And we all have a common goal that we want more Americans to be serving our country. Uh, Service Year Alliance, we want national service to be part of growing up in America. We want a year of full-time paid service, what we call a service year, to be a common opportunity and a common expectation for all young Americans. We define a service year as sustained full-time service. It's paid, lasts anywhere between nine and 12 months. Different from episodic volunteering in that a service year involves training and programming throughout the, the, that service term. Uh, personally, my formative service experience uh, has to be from Afghanistan, where I served as an Army Ranger, served uh, four combat deployments there. Being part of a group of Americans from very different backgrounds joined together to tackle a shared problem 
has changed me in very profound ways. Uh, I arrived to the military by, uh, by way of a very unlikely source, which is two very wonderful but very hippie parents. Uh, I was 9-11, uh, I was 17 years old, and that led me to study Arabic in college, and afterwards I taught English to Iraqi refugees in Syria. Uh, and that experience uh, inspired me to join the military. Uh, I think if you ask my parents, they would say I, I self-chose to write one too many book reports about Mo Berg in Hebrew school, uh, and that contributed to my uh, studying languages and joining the military. Uh, service Alliance right now, there are tectonic happenings right now in the national service community. Uh, for us, the greatest opportunity, there, there is more energy and momentum around a piece of federal legislation than there has been in over a decade. It's called the Core Act, spelled like Marine or Peace Corps. Um, it feels like a gener once in a generation moment. We need to take advantage of it. Our biggest challenge right now um, has to be related to social justice in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and ensuing events. Um, the, the, our service your lives well before I showed up as CEO uh, last fall has been working very hard on, on uh, its work in diversity and equity and inclusion. National service brings people together. It's one of the best parts about it. Um, having said that, the, the national service, the architecture of the national service community was built uh, in the early the Clinton administration. Um, and in terms of who serves in service years and where that service takes place, which communities, there's a lot of work to be done. So we're, we're in this once in a generation moment for opportunity. But if, if we don't fix some of the, the challenges inside these institutions uh, while executing on this opportunity, we will have failed. Um, so that's, that's for us, that's our biggest opportunity and challenge right now. And I just wanna say thanks again for having us. Great, Jesse, thanks so much. Cindy. Laura, Jesse, Natalie, I just first wanna thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this conversation. It's, um, I already feel inspired just being uh, on the webinar with you. So thank you so much. And tomorrow and to our friends at JFN, thank you so much for, for agreeing to host. Um, Jesse and Natalie, everything you said resonates so much with me. I mean, Repair the World mobilizes Jews and our communities to take action to pursue a just world. And we know that this work has never been um, more relevant and more important, more pressing than it is in this moment. Um, our goal is to inspire a lifelong commitment to service for our participants. We know in the Jewish community that young Jews volunteer in a disproportionately high, um, high rate compared to their peers. The last study I, I saw showed that something like 50% of Jewish young adults have volunteered in the past year and that 82% have engaged civically. Um, so we know that it's something that young Jews care very deeply about and that was before the pandemic and before the uprisings. Um, so I'm sure that that number just continues to grow. Um, so we know and we believe that service and support of social change is really vital both to a flourishing Jewish community and to an inspired Jewish life. And we've set a really ambitious goal at Repair. We want to catalyze and inspire a million acts of service um, by 2030. Um, I think we might even get it done by 2028 with the way <laughs> things are going. Um, I would say in terms of my, um, my inspiration, I think one of the more pivotal stories in my um, experience was working in, um, in Brooklyn in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. Um, I wound up, uh, I was leading a Jewish organization at the time and we mobilized thousands of volunteers um, to support the needs of our fellow New Yorkers. And there was so much learning from that experience. I think most profound was this idea that the Jewish community, when we're organized, um, wants to show up, wants to do good in the world, um, and has the ability to make a profound impact um, if we just create those opportunities um, for them. Um, a second piece was that the needs that were um, exposed in the emergency were um, both about the emergency and they were about the way that our systems in America are failing people who are experiencing poverty. Um, and I think that point is more important now than, than ever before. Um, and I would say the third piece that, that was so important for me is that service is both about the impact that we have on the people that we're serving um, and it's also a really powerful act of solidarity, right? Feeding a person obviously um, supports them in their daily struggle with the food, but it's also about the act of saying, I see you, I hear you, I'm with you, um, and I care about what's happening to you. Um, and for me as a Jewish person and as a Jewish leader, that's, that's actually the central narrative of our Jewish story, um, is that we're obligated as Jews to show up, to care for our neighbors, to be concerned about the people who are most vulnerable. Um, so that act of service becomes a very powerful Jewish spiritual act. Yeah. Beautiful, thank you, Cindy. 
So I, I would just add from my personal experience, um, I, I was, uh, I'm on the board of the Aspen Institute. I was sitting in the audience at the Aspen Ideas Festival just about five years ago and heard General Stanley McChrystal being interviewed by Bob Schieffer in a, a tent of 3,000 people. And Bob Schieffer ended his conversation with, so General McChrystal, if there was one thing you could do for our country, what would it be? And everyone was expecting reinstate the draft. And he said, you know, the most important thing we need to do today is to provide opportunities for every young person to do a year of service. And I would love to make it mandatory, and I know that that's not popular, so let's make it voluntary, but let's make it expected. And that's the beauty of what I believe this whole service ecosystem is about. And so as a result of that, I got very involved in the service world, and um, I'm, I'm so pleased that I serve on the Jim Joseph Foundation Board, and Jim Joseph has been extremely generous to, to, uh, to repair the world, and we're delighted that uh, repair has done such great work. And through uh, the Aspen Institute, the Points of Life Foundation, and the Service Year Alliance are great partners. And so I, I wanna just pivot back to each of you to talk about how in this moment have things so dramatically changed as a result of racial justice issues and, and the pandemic and the ways that, that, that young people can be of help? How have, have, has, have things changed for you and your organization? Natalie, could we start with you? Sure, um, well, I'll, I'll take that in two parts. Um, so when we, we talk about the pandemic in particular, uh, you know, um, we're really in the midst of uh, social distancing and doing things um, in different ways. And so what we've learned um, as a nonprofit and organization that's working with nonprofits as well as uh, an organization that works with corporations is that um, to keep people engaged, you have to pivot. Um, I'll give you one example, um, Points of Light each year we host um, a really big conference. We usually attract uh, a couple of thousand um, people. This year we had to pivot uh, and not do that conference in person. It was uh, going to be in Washington, D.C., our 30th anniversary. And when you pivot, uh, it, it means that you're not postponing, you're not canceling, but you really have to think about, so how does this experience translate to digital or online? And then you have to put the work in. And I have to say that um, uh, this year, we, we just completed the conference. We had over 8,000 people registered, um, nearly 4,000 on at one time. And it just goes to show you that people um, continue to want to be engaged. So I would say the pandemic has um, really caused us and our partners to think about how they engage people differently because they want to be engaged. When we think about um, the social justice issues, um, that's a little different. Um, you know, one of the things that we know is that there are experts and people who have been working in the social justice space for a very long time. And so we are reaching out to um, those um, experts and individuals uh, so that we can just work with them. Uh, we also have partners like uh, Seattle Works. It's uh, one of our affiliates. Um, back in 2016, uh, they actually prioritized equity and, um, and worked on some materials to support um, equity and social justice in their community. And so we definitely are working with uh, one of our partners who's stronger in, um, in that space. But then we're also advising uh, corporations that you really have to be authentic in what you say uh, and authentic in what you do and, uh, and make sure that it is aligned with your corporate goals and corporate as aspirations. Uh, and so it's, it's, um, it's a, a, a tough space, but you know, it's like I have some statistics that I'll be happy to share a little later. Uh, in terms of uh, the young population, they really, really are engaged on this uh, issue. They want to see a dif uh, difference. They want to be um, engaged. And uh, I don't think that any one of us can really sit or stand on the sidelines. When the pandemic struck, uh, the first thing we did was as an organization, take a look in the mirror and try to ask ourselves the hard questions that we, we thought were important to ask. Uh, so we started from the, uh, the starting point of th there is no guarantee that national service will be relevant in light of coronavirus. And there's no, there's even less guarantee that service alliance will be relevant. 
Um, we thought it was really important to ask those tough questions, like many nonprofits and for-profit companies. Um, out of that, we, we recognized the first thing we needed to do was there, there are people whose service was interrupted and they needed to, we need to figure out how to get them back in service. And that we uh, have access to communities of people who are predisposed to want to be to run towards the problem. Um, so we run something called serviceyear.org. It's a matching platform. If you're a young person who wants to do a year of service and there's an organization uh, with an open position, you come to serviceyear.org and we'll match you. So we started a, a COVID recruiting campaign to get as young, many young people on board. If you were a nonprofit, we'd waive your fee. We'll help write your profile. We just wanted to get as many people to the front lines as quickly as possible, or at least in um, safe, creative service, virtual, virtual service. The other thing, we, uh, we were the stewards of um, something called the AmeriCorps Alums brand. We actually um, received it from Points of Light several years ago. Uh, and th those are people who have done a year of service. I think Teach for America, but all the other uh, programs that fall under the AmeriCorps brand. They are obviously predisposed to be wanting to be part of the solution. So we were just feeding them as much information about volunteering and how they could help as quickly as possible, including pointing them to many points of light resources, to be frank. Um, the second thing we realized was that the National Service Committee was going to have to come up with different and new core models that didn't exist six months ago or existed in a very small, disparate way. We're just going to have to expand it. None of us were talking about, I, I guarantee you there's no contact tracing service year model six months ago, nine months ago, it just didn't exist. Um, today it's happening across the country. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, we had to figure that out and figure it out fast. Uh, and then the last part is we, as, as the scope and scale of the pandemic really became into focus, it became clear the national service, the greatest expansion in the, in the 20th century was in the wake of the Great Depression. Um, and we knew we needed to put together an agenda that would bring about a mass mobilization on the scale of the CCC of the WPA coming out of the Great Depression. Um, and so we are working on that. And the first, the biggest temple, the, the tent in the temple right now is the, the CORE Act, uh, sponsored by Senator Coons from Delaware, Senator Wicker, his Republican counterpart from Mississippi. It would create 600,000 service year opportunities. And by the end of year three, it would take the national service community, which right now is about 75,000 service years per year, all the way up to 250,000. So that's a game that is a, a massive mobilization that really would meet the moment. And then George, the George, the question also George Floyd. I mean that that was uh, another sea change. Um, and you know I, I mentioned who serves and where they serve, and that starts with the work we do. So in terms of who serves, when when you get into the weeds, it's questions around if you get federal funding, there's a, a stipend that goes with it. It needs to be higher. It's tied to the federal poverty level. It, it's not enough. Um, if you want to tap into communities who currently don't have as many opportunities to serve, you have to talk about wraparound services and this has to be worked in the legislation. Um, and then we're trying to do the work internally. So we just started a deliberate strategic planning on our work around DEI. It's, it's, we already know it's going to be around 18 months and it's going to everything from how we hire to implicit bias training to screening the vendors we choose to make sure we're, we're supporting and and putting our, our, our money where, um, where our values are. So, well, sorry for the long answer, but uh, two, two crises, Thanks. really three. <laughs> really helpful. Okay, Cindy, please. So I think it's important to, um, to start by saying that we're just, um, we're seeing unprecedented need in our communities and the, the need for service has never been stronger. Um, we work with more than 60 nonprofits across eight communities, and we have full-time volunteers who are doing a year of service um, who are working with those partners, and then thousands, well, tens of thousands of other volunteers who are coming out for one-off service opportunities. Um, and what we're hearing from our partners, you know, not surprising, the first thing we heard was that they were, are in dire need of um, resources and financial support. Um, and then the next thing that we have really been hearing from them is just that there's, there's so much need. Um, we're talking about um, food pantries and soup kitchens who are seeing um, not like not a hundred percent increase, but like a thousand percent increase in the in the needs in their community. So, so it's never been more important for us to find a way to mobilize people both for full full time service and for episodic service. Um, of course, the pandemic and the need for social distancing really uh, made it challenging for people. I think we can be. Um, 
those of us who are, who are um, you know, have been very committed to social distancing can be proud that that in and of itself is a mitzvah, is like a great act of care for our fellow neighbors. Um, and it's, of course, it's insufficient, right? That's, that has to be the starting place. And the question is like, what more can we um, be doing in this moment to support our neighbors who are really experiencing, um, really experiencing hardship, both from the, the pandemic itself and from the, from the recession. We know that communities of color, particularly black communities, have been disproportionately impacted by both, um, both the disease and the, um, and the recession. So now more than ever, our service, um, our service is important. Um, we knew in the early days of the pandemic that it would be really important to identify ways for, for people to volunteer um, uh, remotely, um, especially for people who are, <clears throat> Who are vulnerable and who need to, you know, who really need it for their own protection to be staying home. Um, so we actually launched an online platform called Skills for Impact um, in partnership with Catch a Fire, um, where volunteers who have skills in logo design or tax, uh, you know, tax advice can actually get matched with a nonprofit in the community and to do um, a project for them. Um, we know, especially as our nonprofit partners are facing. Um, are facing layoffs and all kinds of challenges and their staff becomes reduced, that skilled volunteering is going to be a really critical part of, um, of our country's recovery. So that's, I would say, one really important piece of work. Um, I would say in the Jewish community, there's an acknowledgement across across all of the major organizations that this is a moment where service needs to be a priority for the whole community, both because it's needed and because if the Jewish community wants to be relevant for young people, um, this is what young people are, are asking for in this moment. So we've put together a really broad coalition of more than 30 partners, including everyone from Moisha House to Hillel, um, to the JCC Network, to JFNA, and many, many more um, for a, what, you know, what really feels to me like a monumental alliance called the, Jew the Jewish Service Alliance. Um, and the call to action is threefold. Um, one is that we're launching a core very much in the spirit of what Jesse is describing. We'll have, um, we'll have 100 core members volunteering across 10 cities um, this summer. Um, for a month, a paid, you know, stipended program, which we're so excited about, and then 300 core members in the fall and spring across 15 cities, and maybe even more if we can, if we can raise the money for it. Um, the second call is for episodic volunteering, so we'll be putting together a platform where all of the partners um, who will be trained and, and incentivized to be offering episodic volunteering, we'll put that all together so there'll be really a go-to place for um, opportunities for episodic volunteering, both in person and virtually. Um, and the partners have all agreed to be part of four campaigns throughout the year. Um, we're looking really based on Natalie's advice. Natalie, very early on in this conversation, thank you so much, Natalie, um, shared that what she was seen across um, across the network was a focus on four main areas where service was really needed and where volunteers could be helpful um, and that's hunger um, learning loss and um, and the education gap unemployment and social isolation so four areas that are, are of great need right now for volunteers um, and we're going to be hosting four campaigns across all 30 organizations um, over the course of the next year and mobilizing tens of thousands to be um, volunteering um, in terms of how, how this intersects with, um, with racial justice, it's not like it's two issues, right? All of the work that we do in service has to be grounded in a deep understanding and appreciation for the ways in which communities of color and black communities in particular are um, experiencing inequity and in the way the system is really set up um, to uh, oppress people of color. Um, and so much of our service is about meeting pressing needs, but our service has to be about more than that. It has to really be about engaging our volunteers in understanding not just the immediate needs of a community, but in really asking deep questions around why the service is needed. Like, why is there hunger in America? Why is one of the wealthiest countries in the world still, um, you know, still having such a, a huge, a huge need for hunger? And why are communities of color disproportionately impacted? So those are the conversations for us that's, that goes hand in hand with service. Um, service for us has to include questions about systemic inequity and why the service is needed in the first place. Um, and it also has a Jewish lens. What does our Jewish tradition have to say about, um, about why the service is needed, about how we want to show up as Jews, about um, what it means to be giving and what we prioritize um, as a community. So 
the racial justice component, I think, is really critical. Um, and I would say the other piece of it is to make sure that all of the service that we do, and I know this is true for, for all three of our organizations, is that the service is grounded in deep partnership. Right? Like we don't come into a community with solutions or with ideas about um, what needs to be done in the community. The, the whole point of service is to uplift um, the people who are most impacted, to let them direct the future of their community and to help build their capacity by showing up and supporting and supporting their work. I'm so important. Wonderful. Thank you, Cindy. So, uh, you know, I, I have to say that this is a very personal thing for me and for my husband, Gary. Uh, both of our kids have done gap years, have done service years where they've, they've worked in, in various places. And it was just enthralling and, and, and so, uh, so much of a growth experience for them and, and enabling them to be more empathetic with the world. And it really gave them a sense of the tikkun olam requirements that our, our, our Jewish tradition requires of each of us. So, so it's very personal, and, and I'm sure it is for all of you listening, and, and, and I hope that as you, as you gain some insights about how these organizations are doing this work, I hope you'll also come up with some questions so that, uh, that after, I'm, I'm going to ask two more questions, and then I'm, we're going to open it up. So be, be ready to, uh, to ask those questions, and, and you can raise hand in, your, in the participant box. Um, so my, my, my next question is really about the role of funders. Okay, this is the Jewish Funders Network. We are all funders and we are all passionate about our work and, and the way we vote is with our dollars in terms of how, how we want to have an impact in the world. And we, we want to, to see scalable, leverageable opportunities. And so my question to you is, how, how do you work with funders? How do, how do funders influence how your, your strategy or your direction and 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 frankly what is the role of funders for each one of you in, in what you're what you're doing natalie why don't you start us off sure uh, and, and thank you laura well uh, first of all we are really grateful for um for funders for people who um, decide to invest their resources into points of light or any of our organizations um, or any nonprofit that is doing work um, in the community. And, you know, the first thing that we would ask is for funders to really get to know an organization, uh, to follow their heart and follow their passion because giving uh, should be joyful. Uh, we think it should be joyful and, um, and solutions oriented. We're also... Um, asking funders uh, to really, if you appreciate the mission uh, that the organization stands for, particularly in this time, uh, to, to allow that organization to be nimble. Um, funders uh, traditionally like to invest in a specific program or a specific initiative. And organizations today need unrestricted general operating dollars. Um, they really need unrestricted general operating dollars to get from uh, you know, today to tomorrow. And so we're, uh, we're also asking uh, funders to, um, to consider, you know, just giving a gift outright um, if you respect and um, appreciate and value the leadership of that um, organization. And then combined with, um, with your giving, we also ask um, funders to use their voice um, and um, to open their network and to introduce uh, organizations to more of their friends or people that they know that might also share their passion and share their interest uh, because organizations need to have a variety of um, partners who are willing to invest in them and so it, it is about yes receiving dollars but it is also about finding others who have other um, assets or um, interests and ways to support uh, that organization so that's um where we would start. Great, Natalie. Just a quick follow-up for you. Um, what percentage of your support is corporate, government, and or individual? Yeah, sure. About 70% of, um, of our support is uh, corporate, and uh, I would say about 15% is um, individual, and uh, the rest is from um, events that we, yes. Okay. So about 15%. Great. Yes. Thanks. Okay, Jesse? We, uh, we just launched something called what we're calling the Rapid Response Learning Cohort. Uh, and we, we've, we determined early on that, uh, especially because there just isn't a unified federal response to these crises, um, 
there are lots of programs and states who are trying to deploy national service to tackle the problems in their own backyard. Um, one, thing, one thing Service Reliance does really well is convene learning communities. Um, so our what we're, Rapid Response Learning Cohort is going to bring together, there are three or four governors right now who are already using their, their National Service Corps members to do things such as contact tracing. Um, and there are about six to 10 other states who are one or two obstacles away. So we're going to bring everybody together um, and help those six to 10 states get unlocked and operationalized. Um, and these are really disparate efforts. So we're going to help establish best, best practices, create several models for whoever wants to try this next. Um, the, we just received a commitment from a funder. Uh, we haven't gone public on this yet, so I can't name uh, the name here. Uh, but the one thing I really appreciate in this moment, um, it was just an ongoing conversation. Um, this funder knew us, we knew them, uh, and this was happening, this is March, but things are breaking and every day feels like the, the scope and scale of the crisis, which is gonna look a little bit different. And I, I really appreciated um, being asked, not once, but multiple times, where do you see your value add? Who else is doing this? Where, where really um, can you make the most impact? And we ended up, uh, I think the two or three different, the, the proposal shifted based on the conversations. Um, and it was, it really felt like a partnership because we were, uh, we all understood that the, the external environment was just shifting under our feet every day. Um, and we all work towards the same goal. So just the back and forth, I, I, I can't tell you how much I just appreciated the ability just to be able to walk in and say, this is what we're thinking today. It might change tomorrow. We figure this out. We've half figured this out. Let's talk it through. Um, and the, the rapid response learning cohort, we, we know that, con so the first thing we're gonna tackle is contact tracing. And we're gonna pivot as appropriate when the next urgent community need pops up. And that might be six weeks from now, might be 10 or 12 weeks from now. Um, we think the next, uh, issue we'll, we'll tackle is high school grads in the 20, the class of 2020 and 2021 and, and connecting those career and education pathways. Um, and we'd love to explore with any funders here or elsewhere um, what sort of connected tissue we think we need to be creating. And I just, the back and forth and just the ability to have some really candid, honest, in mm -hmm. part, uh, learning in pairs to, to butcher some Hebrew um, was it meant a great deal. So. Great. Havruta service. I love that. <laughs> okay, Cindy. Um, Jesse, we'll have to talk about the, the contact tracing because I think that could be a great role for our Serve the Moment core members. Um, that would be really exciting. Um, I just, I have to say, um, I've been in awe of our funders in this moment and the way the Jewish funding community has, um, has showed up um, to support us and to support um, to support service and to think really deeply about um, how the pandemic is going to be impacting the Jewish community. I'd say our funders, one of, the, one of the biggest gifts from our funders has been that they have encouraged us to dream really big, right? In a time of contraction, in a time where so many of our nonprofit um, partners are thinking about um, uh, contracting and of course we've had to go through that also but they've also encouraged us encouraged our whole team to really think big about the role that service can play in this moment um, they've made a financial commitment to it in a in a serious way they've assured us of steady funding and many of them have increased funding um, they've reached out to involve others um, i'd say they've provided wonderful support and um, just really wise counsel around um, how we build out the new jewish service alliance um, and have provided much more than just funding, right? It's been the support, it's been the council, it's been staff time, connections, advice, resources, um, and our, our largest funders have also done something really beautiful, which is that they've made space for others, right? So it's been very important to the large funders that they, um, that they make space, that they encourage other funders to leave their mark and to help shape the program um, alongside of us, especially as we launch in new cities, right? Local, local funders always want to, you know, always talk about the uniqueness of their community and the way the program needs to be tweaked to meet the needs of their community. And there's been so much flexibility um, from our funders in thinking about that, which I really, um, I really appreciate. Um, they've also, most of our funders have, um, have changed their reporting structure so that in this moment where we're all being stretched, there's less less reporting needs and also maximum flexibility. Um, I have to say the way that the Jewish funders put together very quickly the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund, which was um, where our initial funding came from, from the Jewish Service Alliance to me was so inspiring. And now to see that same process having been mirrored in so many communities where federations have put together emergency response funds um, has been tremendous. And seeing that the emergency response funds are both 
um, of course, a very important piece of their focus is on ensuring the continuity of um, uh, legacy Jewish organizations and of the needs of the Jewish community. And so many of them are eager to fund our involvement and engagement with our non-Jewish neighbors and to, to fund the support that volunteers can bring in, um, in a recovery, not just for the Jewish community, but for the whole country. Um, and that to me is like, it's the best of Jewish values and the best of who we are as a people. Wonderful. Thank you, Cindy. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, uh, when, when our kids were thinking about, you know, their college experience, we actually made it pretty clear to them that we expected them to take a gap year, a, a service year between high school and college or after college, but it's an expectation. And, and, and what we found is that the universities, this isn't a thing actually so much. It's, it's not something that they really uh, uh, encourage, let's just say. You know, in, in Britain and in Australia, this is a thing, you know, everyone, not a lot in terms of 100%, but close to 50% of kids take a gap year between high school and college in, in, in England. And so, um, you know, we, we think it's very important to, to, to encourage colleges and universities. So when we talk about the role of funders, one thing that, uh, that we ended up doing is speaking to our children's alma maters, their, their universities, and, and encouraging them to put a box on their application form. When would you like to enroll? This fall? Or would you consider taking a gap year? And if so, check this box. And then we ended up giving uh, some, some funding for, uh, uh, for, for scholarships for those students who wanted to take a gap year to defer a year and, that, and to do a year of service that, and, uh, and, and couldn't necessarily afford to do it any other way than, than if they got uh, funding for it. And, and I was so happy to see that today, colleges and universities, for the most part, at least the private ones, are prepared to allow all students to defer for a year after, after admission but it's still not a thing. You know, it's maybe 50, maybe 100 students. So, so doing a gap year is, is just something that I'm hoping that we as, a, as, a, as an ecosystem can encourage our colleges and universities to do more of. Hey, Laura, I, I, I'd, yes, I'd, actually like to, I'd actually like to build on that uh, because, um, you know, at Points of Light, we, uh, we have this um, concept. We talk about people being engaged and how you move an issue forward. Uh, and we are focused on volunteerism, but we know from uh, the CNCS, the Corporation for National Service, that 30% of people uh, say they volunteer, but 60% say that they get involved in other ways. And those other ways that you lean in is uh, through your vote, um, through donating, through using your voice, of course, volunteering. And then we find a large percentage is uh, through national service uh, and, and also being a, a social entrepreneur. But what we're saying is that these are your superpowers. Um, this is how you actually can move uh, an agenda forward. And, uh, and so national service is really a very important part of that. And so thank you for, um, for stressing and emphasizing that. Yeah, and, and, and Jesse will talk in a minute about the CORE Act so that we can get a sense of how does our government uh, support that, that, that same idea. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about statistics. Natalie, you are, you're going to, to jump into this. And what I'd love to ask, ask you to talk about is how, how, how do we look at our numbers? How many, student, how many folks are actually doing this? Um, and, then, and then I also am very curious about how you market so where do you see the demand and, and how do you market to that demand? What are the demographics that you, that you direct your marketing to? And, and, and then of course, what are the statistics of, of the folks that are, are participating? Natalie? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, we look at statistics from a number of different places. And, uh, you know, I will tell you one resource that is really important to us is the um, Edelman Trust Barometer. And the Edelman Trust Barometer is a report that comes out, it's issued uh, every year. It is, uh, it measures the trust in institutions around the world. Um, they present it at Davos. And um, they recently um, 
uh, issued a report that is on um, social justice and brands, right? And so because we have a, um, a large um, partnership with corporations, we have uh, over 100 um, companies that are a part of our Corporate Service Council, um, really uh, members of the Fortune 500. And uh, when we were advising them just about the social justice issue in particular, um, here are a couple of uh, statistics that I think are really important. So for any of your donors that are also CEOs or board members um, for, uh, for corporations, we think this is important information to know. That 60% uh, of people said that brands must take um, stands publicly and that they would buy or boycott a brand based on how it responds to social injustice. 70% um, of young people under the age of 24 say that they are concerned about racism. 42% of people say that they would not work for an organization that fails to speak out publicly and support uh, the needs to address racial inequality. And 60% say that companies need to actually invest in addressing the root causes of racial inequality. And so this is just in one particular area. You know, I do think it is important for, um, for donors, for nonprofits, uh, for leaders, uh, wherever you are, to uh, reach out, uh, to uh, go to resources, uh, reputable resources that are keeping a pulse um, on society and learn from that. The one thing that I will say about um, young, the younger um, generation, um, there was this book I read, it's called The New uh, um, Leadership Literacies, and it is by um, Bob Johansson. He's a futurist, and he talks about shape-shifting shape hierarchies and the fact that this newer generation, they are not, um, they, they don't look for um, hierarchies uh, or permission. Uh, to get involved, uh, to get engaged, that they actually will move um, without us or beyond uh, us. And so um, I worked in education for a very long time, for about 15 years. And uh, the one thing that we would say when we wanted to get parents involved was notification was not an invitation. So to send a flyer home to a parent was not the same as inviting a parent in. And uh, when you really want to get people engaged, uh, you have to invite them. And so. I would start there. Great, Jesse. Uh, let me just talk about the core act real quick before uh, we run out of time. So the, the, there, there, this is there is a once in a generation moment right now in terms of federal legislation. So the core act, uh, as I mentioned, it would it would provide six hundred thousand service year opportunities. It would increase. We go from seventy five thousand service years right now to two hundred fifty thousand. Um, it would double the size of the education award, uh, so you get uh, an award you could apply towards college after your, your service. Can, can you give the numbers? So it's a $5,000 education stipend today, and it would double to 10? It would uh, actually go up to just about 13. Uh, so depending, uh, about six and a half to 13. 175% um, increase in the living allowance, which is the stipend. Um, and what, what does that equate to? The, so today so it's what, about 25,000? Uh, that's correct. It, it's tied to uh, cost of living and the zip code, uh, so it varies a little bit. Um, there's a lot of work, a lot of work to be done here. Uh, the bill calls for a, a massive partnership between AmeriCorps and the CDC to provide additional surge capacity in public health. Um, and then one, another thing I just want to highlight: it, it will put some of the program authority and some of the funding power into state commissions. Every state has a national service commission at the state level appointed by the governor, uh, state and territory. Um, and some of the program authority and flexibility will go to the state level. So they could place their own core members, which just means local communities, whatever they see is the most pressing issue, they could deploy their own national service assets. Um, I think one thing the national service community has done really well since the, the, since the efforts that began in the Clinton administration is make the altruistic case for national service. Mm -hmm. um, for better or for worse, the, the majority of national service programs are happen to be located in major urban centers. Um, the reason that we haven't had a massive uh, um, increase in national service at the federal level since since 9-11 um, has it just hasn't been bipartisan support on the right. Um, the, the core act right now has 14 original co-sponsors, seven Democrats, seven Republicans. Uh, the lead co-sponsor on the Republican side is, is Senator Wicker from Mississippi. Um, Senator Cornyn, from Texas is one of the co-sponsors. I mean, 
one of the states that went early on contact tracing is Texas. Um, it's not, it's not a separate, you, you can draw a direct line between um, what's happening on the ground and, and, and Texas and a, a center like Senator Cornyn coming on board. Just to put that in perspective, that's about as much, that's about seven more Republican Senate co-sponsorships we've had in about a decade. Um, so right. we, we're fully deployed, our board, our leadership council, you are included. Um, are, uh, we're, we're doing everything we can to, to, to work on getting this across the finish line. Um, Bravo. So I, thank, you, Jesse. thank you, Jesse. You're welcome. Super exciting. Okay, Cindy. Just, you know, we'll do everything we can to support. It's, uh, it's really, it's an amazing effort. We're so happy to be a part of it. I, um, you started talking about the altruistic uh, case for service, which I think is compelling. And Laura, you asked kind of what, what sparks young people and what makes them want to do the service. And I think um, one of the things that we're finding is that um, a blended model is so important in terms of um, using, uh, using uh, I would say, uh, catalyzing young people who are deeply engaged in a year-long experience and who are super committed to service, um, basically catalyzing them to bring their peers along. Um, and that sending out a flyer for a service opportunity is not, we, we, that totally resonates, Natalie. That does not work in our communities. And that's why um, in our eight communities, we have a group of core members who are spending a year doing service. Part of their role is to do their own direct service and community, but a big piece of their role is to organize their peers and to make those personal invitations um, to invite people in. Service needs to be social, right? It needs to be connected to community. It needs to be connected to friendship. Um, and it needs to be uh, like connected very deeply to people feeling like they're making part of a, uh, that they're a small part of making a much bigger difference, right? And that, that message that what you're doing today matters and it's gonna have so much more impact because there's another group coming tomorrow and there's another group coming the day after that, um, I think also really matters. Um, my grandpa was in the CCC, which as a kid, I didn't fully appreciate the story, but he was, you can imagine my, my Jewish grandpa was a, um, he was a tree topper out in Oregon. Um, and what I've come to understand as an adult, now that I really understand what that program was about and why service mattered so much in those years, um, is that of course it gave tangible benefits in terms of developing the national parks, right? Like the impact was important, um, but it also, it also provided so many um, advantages for my grandpa and for the million others who are part of the program and that's what service does right it it increases their health it increases their education level it, um, it provides an improvement in terms of um, employment expectancy um, and of course it, there's also the deeper pieces that are hard to measure right it, it, it gives people a sense of purpose a sense of meaning a sense of contributing um, and for the sake of this conversation it all it also gives people um, you know, who connect that to their Jewish values, a deep sense of connection to their, to their Jewish narrative, narrative, Cindy, narrative history, yeah. Cindy, tell it, to give us a sense of your statistics. How many, how many young people last year and hopefully next year will, will do a, a year of service through, through repair? Um, so this year, uh, this past year, we've had uh, 30 people doing a year of service, but have engaged close to 50,000 acts of service through those young people. So it's really a multiplier effect um, that each person who's doing a year of service is catalyzing thousands of others to be serving alongside them um, to help build the capacity of our service partners. And we're hoping to more than double that um, in the year to come and to engage um, the Jewish community in 100,000 acts of service in the coming right. year in response to the pandemic. Okay, I've got a couple questions here from the audience. Based on the statistics Natalie just shared, does the type of service young people are doing matter? Meaning, should most or all service happen in support of tackling the incredibly important issues around racial justice? And if so, what does that mean for other types of service? Natalie, do you want to talk about that? Yes, sure. Um, well, the statistics that I was sharing was really um, just to indicate uh, how important it is for companies to um, find a way to take an authentic stand on what they believe in and how, um, how they will authentically um, work towards uh, uh, address, addressing systemic racism. Um, for service for young people, no, absolutely. It should be based on what their interest is. If you're mm -hmm. interested in the environment, if you're interested in um, in education, uh, it should be based on your interest. Uh, and I, I think that that is where um, it's best to leverage uh, young people. I will share, you know, that I, I said I was in education for uh, 15 years. And so I worked in the Chicago public schools. I worked in the Philadelphia um, public schools. I also was a civil rights lawyer for the US Department of Education. I know that the um, Teach for America um, teachers were part of the AmeriCorps 
fellow program. And those young people who actually were in Teach for America and doing their service year with uh, schools, really wonderful. I also was a, um, a volunteer on City Years Board and uh, that is another um, service program. And so again, the young people who were core members for uh, City Year wonderful in terms of um, the value that they bring to the educational institutions and that one year service that they're engaged in, so. Cindy, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I was gonna, I'm sure Natalie, I'm sure you would agree to this, is that the, the young people's interest is the starting point and it's our role as educators to help them sort of see beyond their immediate interests and that service is such an amazing path for doing that. Um, so a recent study that came out about young Jews aged 22 to 40 called Unlocking the Future of Jewish Engagement um, basically asked that question, like what issue do you care most about and are you most likely to volunteer for? Um, and the number one issue, if you can guess for Jewish young adults, I was shocked, was animal welfare. And this really stood out to me because it's not what I understand from the young people who I'm engaged with who care so much about systemic inequity and hunger and poverty and, and, and racial justice. Um, but I think it, it, it's a challenge to us, right? Like how can we um, have people enter the service, give them a really good experience around animal welfare, um, and then ask them deep questions while they're doing that service around what impact they can have in the world. And hopefully, not that animals aren't important, but hopefully also catalyze interest in, uh, in thinking about the humans that they can serve as well. Wonderful. Um, so uh, we have uh, uh, another question. How do we use this moment to increase the diversity of core members among all types, uh, and among all types of, of, of service year programs? Okay, so his question is mostly about how do we increase diversity? You know what, Cindy, I'm, I'm gonna put that to you because that's not so easy for us here in the Jewish community. And so what, what would, how would you respond to that? Sure, well, I think first of all, the, um, it's critical that any initiative in the Jewish community reflect the racial diversity of the Jewish community ourselves, right? So we have um, this year, 20% of, um, of our core members were people of color and Jews of color. Um, our participants, uh, um, I'm trying to remember exactly, I think it was 30% of our participants identify as non-white or as people of color. And so it's, it's critical that both the people who were engaging um, it's critical that the people who were engaging in the service represent the full diversity of the Jewish community. And as I said earlier, it's critical that the service happen in deep partnership and alongside our non-Jewish neighbors, which of course also has a rich, um, a rich diversity. I think, I think the way we do that as a Jewish community is by making sure that at the highest levels of the organization, in terms of our staff leadership, in terms of our board leadership, um, that we are, um, have diverse representation um, and that we're in serious and genuine partnership with our community partners and giving them a, an important voice at the table. Um, we know yeah. repair that 70% of our Jewish participants say they come to repair the world events because they want to meet like-minded people and 70% of our participants come because they say they want to create connections across lines of difference and that's exactly the mix that we want, right? We want people to find um, in service yeah. people who are like them and we want them to also be engaging with in full partnership people who are, um, who are different from them. Great. Jesse, do you want to address, I mean, certainly AmeriCorps is a, is a I think it's of the 75,000 current spots, about half are full-time, is that right? And so can you give us a sense of, a, of that and then the diverse nature of that and how we move forward in encouraging more diversity? Sure, uh, it's, it's about close to 60,000, but it's not enough. Um, there's a, we don't have all the answers. Let me tell you what we're doing. Uh, so number one, the, any new legislation that passes, things like the living stipend and things like wraparound services, there's a background check requirement, um, which, which needs to change or look different. Um, another thing we're doing, we, we run a, another learning community. It's, uh, it's a network of what we call our impact communities. And it's 10 communities that represent the country. It's as small as East Boston and as large as the state of South Carolina. What they have in common is a local dedicated partner who is all in a national service and they're using national service to tackle what they see as the biggest problems in their own backyard. And they're, they're tackling diversity in different ways. And part of our job is to make sure that a success story in one is shared within that community and then brought to, the, to turn into a national proof point. Our partners in Texas, for example, um, discovered if you change some of the programming, the way you, you recruit for service years and you shift from, a, from a, an altruistic message where if somebody has the privilege to think about 
uh, a gap beard a different way than somebody who really has to is taking care of family members or brothers or sisters and talk more about the economic and financial benefits and that connective tissue to a career or pathway um, all of a sudden you start to be able to really tackle some of those issues uh, and then the last thing is there, there's some cases to be made um, there, there are new service year core models like contact tracing is a new one around um, social justice that don't exist today and we're, we're, we're trying to figure out and exploring uh, how to create new ones. Natalie, would you like to take a stab at this? We just have a few minutes left. Sorry. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, if I, if I were to point to one, just one thing, first of all, it's, it's a very complex issue. And so none of us have the solutions and, uh, you know, I would just say that it's, it's a complex issue. The one, um, area that I would encourage people to think about or learn more about are just biases. Uh, you know, we all have uh, biases. They're taught to us. We pick them up um, from our experiences. Biases are not always bad. You know, biases sometimes are, are um, to protect us, I would say. Like, if you're in a hospital and you see someone in a white jacket or blue scrubs, your bias is that person is safe. Um, it's either some type of medical professional, and if they have on a white jacket, it's probably an elevated medical professional. And, and um, how you feel around that person is different from um, how you would feel around someone who were, was in plain clothes in that same environment. And so biases, you know, really um, help us uh, um, figure out, um, you know, what feels right to us in that moment, in that context. And so I would say that, you know, one of the first things that we want to do is just learn more about um, the biases that we have, good and bad, and, uh, and begin to address the, them. Wow, absolutely. Well, that is a perfect note to end on, Natalie. Thank you for that. We, we all have, have opportunities to grow and, and no matter what your age, you know, the Peace Corps is something that you can do up all the well, you know, people into their 90s have done Peace Corps. There's only 7,000 Peace Corps spots. And, and, and yet, uh, and then there's all, all city year spots for 18 year olds uh, through national service and then so many wonderful opportunities through repair and points of light. You all have done a fantastic job in giving us a really beautiful sense of, of, of this critically important role for each of us as Americans to do our civic duty, to do our tikkun olam as, as leaders, and, uh, and, and I really want to thank you all for participating. Tamar, back to you. Thank you, Laura. I want to thank all of the panelists, and thank you, Laura, for masterfully moderating this conversation. I know that there was a lot more questions, and we would love to just continue this conversation. We will post this webinar on our website in a few days with information about each of the organizations that our panelists represent so that we can continue this conversation offline. And I'm available tomorrow at jfunders.org to help make those connections. Um, so please reach out. And so thank you all again for, for your time and for the work that you do every day um, to help the community and look forward to, to continuing a partnership and continuing learning together. Thank you everybody.